thank you for joining me and Dr. Donald Frydenberg, my friend and colleague. Um, Dr. Frydenberg is a neurologist who has been specializing in the care of people with dementia, neurobehavioral and neuropsychiatric disorders for the last 42 years. And Dr. Frydenberg has uh, been known for his thoughtful, holistic approach in treating residents struggling in their neurological behaviors to become more comfortable while living and functioning to their fullest and best capacity. He is a rare gem and he will be missed throughout <laughs> our community <laughs> and multiple other communities. So uh, I've personally worked with Dr. Frydenberg for the last uh, 10 years plus and I have been dying just to pick his brain and uh, we have an hour of so many questions I want to ask and have on tape so we can continue to show this uh, for years and years to come. So. Um, I'm super excited. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to it. Don't so, ask me anything hard. <laughs> no. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is just overall the lack of dementia training. And, you know, in nursing school, I remember we maybe had one lecture on dementia. We had no clue what dementia even was. And when I first um, started working in a nursing home, I remember my first demented resident. I didn't even know what dementia was. I just thought he was crazy and uh, I just remember calling the doctor and saying I don't know what to do this guy is yelling he keeps trying to get out of his bed and we just kept getting order and order for Ativan and when that didn't work they gave us Haldol and basically if the, if he wasn't asleep in his bed we were calling for an order to get something because we didn't know what we were doing and he couldn't be out in the hallway um, so I guess just tell me your thoughts on the lack of, of dementia training and behavior training throughout medical schools and nursing schools and what you've been seeing over the last 40 years. Yeah, okay. Uh, the, the problem is that dementia falls sort of in between categories in training. Uh, in medical school and nursing school, um, even in neurology. So, you know, I went through a basic neurology program at Ohio State when I did my residency and the amount of dementia related training was pretty small and the neuropsychiatric training was non-existent mm -hmm. so it wasn't until i really did a neurobehavioral fellowship at ucla which was specific for those uh, problems that you know i came to understand what the issues were right so um, the tendency for most uh, physicians is to treat dementia patients like they have primary psychiatric disorders. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big mistake because the medications are not the same. Um, the dosing of the medications are not the same. The expectations of the response to the medications isn't the same. So it, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. And I think there's also a tendency for a lot of caregivers um, and the families to, uh, especially early in the course of a dementia process, to look towards neuropsychological aspects, or, or not neuropsychological, but psychological explanations for biological behavior. You know, in other words, the patient's crawling on the floor, taking off their clothes, uh, you know, urinating in inappropriate places, and they're doing it on purpose. They were always manipulative, and they're manipulative now. Uh, they've always been a difficult person, therefore they're difficult now. You know, when an 84-year-old demented patient urinates on the floor, or comes out of the room without their clothes, uh, it's because of a biological problem. And it's not worsening of the dementia usually, it's some intercurrent illness. So that's missed all the time. Delirium superimposed on dementia is common, and it's commonly missed, and therefore, Medications are layered on that just end up making it worse. I have that on my list. I want to talk about delirium. Okay. <laughs> Definitely want to talk about delirium. Yeah. Um, so I guess that kind of uh, gets me to my point that, uh, and what I'm seeing kind of across the board, and not just in the Danbury communities, but you know, across all different companies that I've worked for, and uh, you know, doing quality assurance of charts, it's. Ativan, 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 and I know we and you have worked together. I know you're not a proponent of Ativan, uh, and it does have its time and place, don't get me wrong, but can you walk everyone through why Ativan is not a first-line choice treatment for somebody with dementia who is having behaviors? Yeah, so uh, first of all, when you, when you think about Ativan, uh, 
um, it's in a class called benzodiazepine. So it's not just Ativan, it's all benzodiazepines in general. Um, and then you have to think about, okay, well, what behavior do they treat um, in dementia? Um, and there hardly is any behavior disorder that I know of that responds to the benzodiazepines well. Uh, so, you know, I've been doing this probably strict neurobehavioral neurology for the 34 years or something like that. And um, I have not come across any behavioral disturbance that I'm convinced that a benzo would be um, useful for. So when you, when you see anxiety, which is what benzos are supposed to be used for, the anxiety syndrome that occurs in patients with dementia is agoraphobia, which is a feeling of what do I do, where do I go, feeling lost, abandoned, needing to buddy up, yelling help, 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 help. Those are the symptoms of agoraphobia. They don't respond to benzos for some reason. And um, the, other, the other behavior that I commonly see benzos tried on uh, is the wanting to leave delusion. You know, I gotta go home, I gotta get out of here, where's mom, where's dad, where are the kids? I gotta go to work, I gotta provide, where's my car? They're trying to get out of the facility. That's, a, that's not anxiety, that's a non-paranoid delusion. It doesn't respond to benzos. Um, but there are other medications that work pretty well if the patient doesn't have delirium. So frequently you have to exclude delirium as a cause of behaviors in general. Um, and then uh, you pick the appropriate medication. So picking the appropriate medication for behaviors is important, right? right? So there are certain pharmacologic subtypes of behavior matched with certain medications. Perfect, yes, yeah. the Freidenberg Bible, which we're gonna get to, I yeah. promise. But yeah. we keep going back to delirium. So let's just cut to the chase. Before we treat any behavior, we have to rule out delirium. So can you tell everyone some symptoms and what primarily you see when somebody is experiencing delirium and then how do we um, rule out that? Okay, so mo most of the patients I get called on, called in to see are patients who were okay a month ago and now are not Ooh. doing so well uh, behaviorally. Um, and it's usually delirium that causes that. So delirium is an acute confusional state. Um, there are some specifics about the classification of delirium, but let's just say that it's an acute confusional state because that's what you're gonna see in patients who have delirium with dementia. There are difficulties with attention and concentration. Um, there are, there, the patient becomes more incoherent. The patient has multi-system effects so that uh, not, so that they have behavioral disturbances and any behaviors can occur. So patients who have had just one behavior, for example, paranoia, now they have paranoia, agoraphobia, wanting to leave. Um, they have, and in addition to behaviors, they have um, motor disturbances. They're, they're more unsteady, they're falling, um, they're not swallowing as well, sometimes they're not eating as well, they're not sleeping as well, um, or they're oversleeping. Uh, so you have multi-system involvement when you have delirium, and it's subacute to acute and onset. Okay, uh, and there's um, usually confusion and just an overall decline in what's going on with the patient. Some patients that we've seen before have um, spread feces throughout the bathroom, and then you you know you get a phone call, and that is you know I remember you always telling me this, this is almost always delirium because right. even a demented person is not going to spread their feces everywhere. Yeah, that's all. They used to call it finger painting. <laughs> so the patient finger paints uh, with stool, and they're doing it on purpose. Right. You know, that just is probably not the case. So the, uh, some of the other common uh, or signs that you see in patients who have delirium is that they they come out of their room without any clothes on. Mm -hmm. Patients with dementia don't do that generally speaking. Um, they're taking their clothes off in public. They're masturbating in public. They're becoming hypersexual when they weren't hypersexual before. Um, they're you know, much more agitated. They have more than one behavior now. They always had just one behavior. Or they're, or they're doing fine and all of a sudden they're not doing fine, you know? So they're becoming more incontinent, uh, you know? So what you're saying is it didn't, the dementia didn't automatically just get that worse. Yeah, it's, it's almost never, 
it's almost never the case that a patient who goes from being okay, you know, two weeks ago to being terrible now, that it's almost never the dementia getting worse. It's almost always an interferent illness and it's almost always delirium. Right, and delirium caused by some infectious state or, or the stasis, which I promise we'll get to. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah it, could be, it could be, you know, a urinary tract infection. And urinary tract infections in patients with dementia don't have to have fever. In fact, they almost never have a fever. They don't have to have a peripheral white count. They don't have, you know, necessarily, um, did I say fever already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they don't necessarily have to have a fever or a white count. And they don't necessarily have to have burning on urination. In fact, they never have that stuff. So it's, it's just a change in confusion, you know, and agitation and all the other signs and symptoms of delirium sometimes. Could be pneumonia, could be dehydration, and again, it could be orthostasis, which we're gonna to get to. Can you think, right, think right. of any other common ones that we're missing? Well, medication side oh, effects. Oh, medication, yes. Well, so the, the, four, the four that are most common are that it's an infection. Mm -hmm. And urinary tract infection is the most common, but pneumonia's in there, dental infections, skin infections, things like that. Um, it could be metabolic disturbances like hyponatremia, hypernatremia, hypoglycemia, um, what else? Hypercalcemia. So th those are some of the things. Then the cardiac conditions like congestive heart failure mm -hmm. um, and orthostatic hypotension would be a cardiovascular problem. Uh, or patients who have atrial fibrillation with an uncontrolled rapid ventricular response or bradycardia uh, and their blood pressure is dropping. Um, and uh, it could be medication side effects. Those are the big four categories. Congestive heart failure, if I didn't mention that, can do it too. So the big thing is I always see you order when we come in and see a, a resident like this is that you'll order, you look at the medications, and sometimes I would say, what, 50% of the time we've seen, I, I love to do quality insurance on charts. I just did this at a building. Somebody yeah. said, you know, so-and-so's not, they're confused and they're falling. We don't know what happened. They actually send the resin out to the hospital, and the first thing I do is look at the chart. I said, how long has this been going on? A month, and look, and a brand new medication was added yeah. the month prior. So right. that's an easy one. Second to that, BMP, CDC, uh, usually a UA if we think it's delirium, right. and or acid, blood, and, and orthostatic blood pressure. Orthostatic blood pressure. And, and so, and make sure the patient doesn't have, you know, congestive heart failure and things like that. But generally speaking, that. 90% of the time you're going to find the answer right. looking at those issues. And we will get to orthostasis, but if we don't find the answer um, and we're looking at a behavior that you need to treat, let's talk about um, targeted, treated behaviors with certain types of medications. Okay, so... Um, do you want me to bring up the behavior and you bring up the medication? Is that easier? We, we, we can do that, all right? Okay. <laughs> Either way. Wanting to leave behavior. So this is the resident that's going to the door all the time. I want to leave. I need to get out of here. I get off my mom and dad. Yeah. What What's your typical medication choice for that? So that's a very common behavior, right? I mean, um, the, the uh, acetylcholinesterases are probably the first choice. So um, Aricept or Exelon. Sometimes I'll use a combo. So I usually start with Aricept because it's once a day. Um, or the Exelon patch, because mm -hmm. it has the least side effects and it's once a day. You want to talk about the side effects? The side effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Sometimes patients are more agitated, sometimes they get depressed with these agents. Uh, sometimes uh, there's an increased risk for GI bleed. That was the patient that we just saw, sorry to interrupt, that I just looked at them in quality assurance. A month later, they had a month prior, she had started Aricep. They couldn't figure out why she was nausea and vomiting and losing weight. And yeah. I think she had even had scopes done. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, sometimes <laughs> patients will have a huge workup. I had one patient Some medication. who um, was sticking their finger down their throat to, to vomit. And so the nursing staff was convinced that the patient was doing it on purpose. I said, well, they're probably doing it on purpose because they're nauseated. <laughs> and I looked and the patient was on 20 milligrams of Aricept today. Well, um, you know, there's very little evidence that anything above uh, 10 milligrams of Aricept is helpful. Right. Um, and and the, the benefit of 10 over 5 is minimal. So I usually use 5 milligrams if I'm going to use something. Also, for the wanting to leave delusion, the smallest doses work. Mm -hmm. So you don't, if you increase the dose, it doesn't work. So if 5 milligrams of Aricept isn't working, 
for that behavior. And by the way, it works pretty quickly. I mean, you, you start Aricept for the wanting to leave delusion, if it's not delirium, then it'll work within a day or two, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if it's gonna work. So Aricept, Exelon, you also use Depakote? Depakote, if Aricept or Exelon don't work, or sometimes I use it five milligrams of Aricept with 1.5 milligrams of Exelon, Exelon in the morning, Aricept in the evening. If that combo doesn't work, I, I then switch to the other drug by itself, um, up to three milligrams twice a day of the Exelon, mm -hmm. up to five milligrams a day of the Aricept if I'm using them by themselves. Um, and um, if that doesn't work, then I'll add Depakote. So you get about 65 to 70% of the patients responding good enough that you don't have to do anything else with just acetylcholine and SPAD. Um, and you get another 20%, maybe 50 to 20% response with rate out of Depakote uh, when you add it. Um, Depakote alone will give you maybe a 40% response rate. So if that wasn't a targeted treatment choice and this person was wanting to leave and the nurses were just fed up and just said, I can't take this anymore, called the primary care physician, can I get an order for Ativan, gave them some Ativan, what would you expect to see? That's not an uncommon scenario. No, it's not. It yeah, so so um, what happens is the uh, Valium or, or Ativan or Xanax will make the patient drowsy. So the patient will calm down uh, and go to sleep, you know. Um, but when they wake up, uh, they're going to be confused. So the confusion aspects of the benzos outlast the sedation. Right. Uh, and so the patient's confused, and in the context of confusional state, they're more unsteady and more agitated. So they're so you're basically causing the patient to be more agitated for for so for for maybe an hour's worth of rest, you know, from the patient. You're going to have a patient who wakes up more agitated, more confused, won't eat. And will fall, right. and, and I've had plenty of patients who fell down within an hour after getting out of van. So, and sometimes Ativan is additive to you know uh, if the patient's on Depakote, it's additive. If the patient's on uh, an atypical antipsychotic, it's additive because those drugs also affect benzodiazepine receptors. Mm -hmm. So it's a problem. Yeah, right. doesn't get you anything anyway. It just gets you short-term relief. Uh, with more burden of falling and all that stuff later. Right, and then just calling for more and more and more and more. Right, time, so. and that, that brings up the issue of PRNs. I, I just mm. want to oh, yeah, get to that, that because uh, PRN medications are a, a huge problem in long-term care. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, as you know, you've heard, uh, and I don't think I've ever prescribed a PRN medication. Why? Uh, because um, the medications, one, are used after the patient's already agitated. So they're, they're you, you know, and a lot of times the patients won't take them, uh, and so you have to hold them down. And the medications that can be given PRN are things that can be given as an injectable. So you're, you're talking about uh, the benzos or Haldol. Okay. Just getting Haldol. Um, so the, 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 you know, what I don't want is to put a PRN and have the nursing staff give that PRN, you know, several times before they call me and let me know that the patient's having a problem. Mm -hmm. So if, the, if there's an acute problem, the physician or, or, or whoever's taking care of the patient medically needs to know about it you, and then try to find out the cause. Right. What is the cause of this acute change in behavior? Well, if you you know if you give a PRN, you don't you're not brought in until the patient falls down and broke know, a hip. A broken hip, you know. So you 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 want to be called when there's an acute problem, mm -hmm. so that you can start to intervene and try to find the cause. Um, and and the other thing is that the PRN medications are likely to cause the patient to fall down Absolutely. and become more confused and stop eating and all that business. So PRN medications, you don't. I don't get called hardly ever. You know, I mean, I get. I get called some during the day, but at night, I hardly ever get called. Partly that's because I make sure that I'm faxed information during the day, but uh, you don't need PRN medications, um, and um, you don't want to use PRN medications for, 
things we just talked about. Well, we've talked about this. I mean, the liability, you know, from a nursing quality assurance standpoint, that you have a nurse, you have that PRN out of van out there, and you have one of the nurses that every shift she comes on, everyone gets out of van. Right. Then when another nurse comes on, they don't give out of van. Right. And so state could easily come in and say, why is this nurse giving it? Why is this nurse not? And go after that nurse's license and have them down as a chemical restraint. Yeah. Well, if the, if the, if the medication does cause sedation, then that is restraint. Absolutely. So, you know, and then that means if you use a chemical restraint in the state of Ohio, you have to see the patient within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's problematic on multiple layers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And something that I've been seeing, and I know you've seen this over the past couple of years, if not more, hospice comes in and writes that order for Ativan for terminal restlessness for when that patient is actively dying. But then we have nurses who are uneducated or maybe don't care, and they choose to give that Ativan for the behavior that that resident is having and not for the terminal restlessness of that patient actually actively dying. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem. That's a problem. So there should, yeah, it's a problem. The, the thing about hospice is hospice is uh, there to help the patient die comfortably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's not my job. My job is to make the patient better. Yep. Uh, they're not, they want to make sure the patient isn't in pain, you know. Uh, so if you're taking care of the patient, um, and you want to make them better, it's better to stay away from those medications because hospice has a whole different intent uh, of using those medications. Um, I've not seen somebody use medication that, of course, maybe I missed it, but uh, use medication like what you're talking about. Yeah. That would be pretty sad. Well, I see it a lot, which yeah. is part of this, this interview process. Yeah. This is what I'm running into. So unfortunately, you know, getting rid of of that order for the time being until that person's active is something that we need to do. Well, you could also ask, I mean, you could also ask the hospice not to use benzos. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they don't need them. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they write 10 different medications, PRN, when they come on a case, right? right? But, but if you, you know, if they're seeing a number of your residents, you don't have, you can tell them, look, we don't want you to use benzodiazepines. Unless somebody calls you and, and gets you okay, you know, that sort of thing. We got off topic. I knew we would. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's so, fine. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I, I didn't know. Uh, so, <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about the one in the delayed behavior with Aricep, Exelon, Depaco. Yeah. Um, another behavior, let's see, which one should we go to next? Okay. Reactive agitation. Reactive agitation. So reactive agitation is the most common uh, behavior in long-term care. Uh, and that's where the patient gets easily agitated. So they're not agitated at baseline, right? Uh, you can have a conversation with them, they could be joking with you, and then you ask them to do something they're not inclined to do, uh, or you redirect them, or you say no, use any negative word or negative gesture, uh, and you breach their threshold. So it's like a short fuse, right? Um, that particular syndrome uh, is common with care, and it's common with redirection. It responds to medications like Efex. I use Efexor, uh, low doses, 12.5 milligrams DID, 18.75 milligrams DID, uh, 25 milligrams POVID. Usually that works. Um, you don't have many side effects from uh, bifidobacin. You have to watch uh, at the larger, if you go up very high, you have to watch for hypertension. Um, you don't usually have sedation from bimlofaxine, but you can. Um, you don't usually have GI bleeds, but all the all those agents can, all the serotonin reuptake inhibitors can cause uh, GI bleeds. Um, you don't have as much nausea and loss of appetite from bimlofaxine as you do from Paxil and things like that. And Zoloft, which is used frequently, tends not to be as effective. It's but you have used it. I have, I've used it, yes. Um, so, and I also use Lamictal. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to use Lamictal, uh, you, you know, you're going to have to check um, blood counts. And, and, um, and we forgot to talk about that with Depakote as well. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, with that, because you have to have blood counts, you have to have liver functions, and the same thing with Lamictal. And what do your orders typically read for Lamictal and Depakote? Can you walk us through what an order would read for that? Okay, so if I'm going to use Lamictal, it's 25 milligrams POQHS DC if a rash develops. So mm -hmm. it can cause a life threatening rash, Stevens Johnson syndrome. Mm -hmm. So I've never seen it in, in elderly patients. But it would be the time that we didn't write the order. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you want to make sure that if somebody develops a rash, they come off the medicine. Um, and I start with 25 milligrams POQHS, and then after a week, you know, they call me back and let me know how the patient's doing, if they're not doing any better. I, I'll slowly increase it by 25 milligrams a day um, and split the dose into a BID schedule. Um, it may go up as high as 75 milligrams twice a day. Mm -hmm. Not working, it's not going to work. Um, Depakote. I usually start at 125 milligrams POBID, and I always get um, a, uh, um, a CBC with diff and an ALT uh, monthly times two, then every three months while they're on Depakote. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also get a lipase two weeks after they start uh, Depakote because I've had several patients who develop uh, pancreatitis uh, on Depakote, even though it's mostly kids that develop pancreatitis. I've had um, probably 20 or 30 patients develop elevations in their lipase, sometimes in the hundreds. Uh, none of them have been symptomatic in terms of pancreatitis, but they've had, and when, when the lipase goes up, I, I just take them off the drug. Um, again, it's not very common, and I've never had a patient symptomatic from it, but it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we're two behaviors in. Yeah. So we talked about reactive agitation, use of Effexor and Lamictal, sometimes Olaf, but yeah. first, first choice is effexor anesthesias. So I want to talk about the movement anesthesias up, down, up, down, and also vocal anesthesia, which you do some really good um, imitations. imitations of, so if you can share that <laughs> with everyone, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so um, anesthesia is uh, an involuntary movement. So there's a, a drive to move, an impulse to action, uh, when there is no stimulus. Okay, so the patient just feels like they have to move. They're compelled to move. Um, and it can be mild, moderate, or severe. So Pacers, just up and down. Yeah, up like and down a lot. They're, they're pacing. They sometimes will grab other people to pace with them. Uh, they sit down and they're right back up. It's one of the movements that interfere with sleep, so they don't sleep well at night because they're up frequently And they pacing. don't eat because they're on the move. They can't the get move. them to sit down yeah. in the dining room. Yeah, you know, sometimes you... You have to give them food they eat on the run. Um, they're agitated too. They um, they don't look you in the eye when they pace. They just pace right through things. They won't go around uh, uh, other patients. Sometimes they'll shove them. Um, and uh, even they're the agitated residents, when you try to redirect them. Even the residents that are wheelchair bound will still. Oh yeah, yeah they, they, it's like this. They're constant, you know? or they're they'll try to sit. Or they're scooting a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, now that can to, also be constipation and bowel problems too, or being or problems. just restlessness related to delirium. Right, or delirium. Okay, so you have to separate. Usually, the differential for anesthesia is going to be delirium, mm -hmm. um, but other things can do it. But mm -hmm. um, at any rate, uh, you can also have anesthesia in the hands. So in, in the legs, it's pacing. It's called tachykinesia. In the hands. It's manifested by rubbing tables, you know, or by clapping, incessant clapping. Um, and in the, uh, in the voice, it's uh, a repetitive uh, noise. So it's, uh, 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 and that can be soft, or it can be very loud, and it can be groaning. Uh, 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 and it's uh, constant. Constant. Uh, uh. So if they take a bite of food, they don't have it while they're swallowing. And as soon as they stop swallowing, it's... You've uh, had people uh, that actually say words, too. Repetitive words. Yes. Occasionally, you'll have repetitive words. Um, that's not as predictable in terms of its response to medication as mm -hmm. these other syndromes are. Or they do, like, yodeling or like yes, whistling yes. or... Yes. That's all no. vocal anesthesia. Probably. Probably. Yeah. So the... Uh, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. The groaning, definitely. Some of those other things, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I make that point is because, again, I'm talking about pharmacologically distinct behaviors that I know respond 
to specific medications and not other medications. So I know that those types of akesthesia respond to the medications. Which is what? That, that I'm going to talk about right now. Because <laughs> okay. then I'm going to talk about the, the word ones. You know, okay. Help, 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 okay. help. Or okay. like re-saying the words over and over again. Yeah. Because that could be treatment to this or it could be something else. So Usually that's not akesthesia. Mm -hmm. but, but, um, so the medications for akesthesia are one, you have to look and see if they're on anything that causes akesthesia. Because mostly it's a tardive movement disorder. Meaning they've been on Haldol, they've been on Risperidol, they've been on Abilify, they've been on Geodon or something, taken off. But sometimes it's just due to the dementia. Um, and the medications, I, I typically start off with amantadine, uh, 50 milligrams twice a day. Uh, if kidney function, you have to look and make sure kidney function's okay. You have to make sure they're not on the Menda. You shouldn't be using the Menda and amantadine together because they're both NMDA receptor antagonists, so there's some toxicity issues there. Um, amantadine can precipitate psychosis, so you want to make sure that the, you know, they don't have, delir they don't have um, delusions as a result of going on amantadine. It can also make orthostatic hypotension worse or cause it, so you want to make sure that they, they don't have orthostatic hypotension when, when you start the medication. It's, it's also a medication that you're not supposed to use in patients who are in congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure they don't have that. But but those caveats are unfrequent or infrequent. So usually you can use amantadine. And the, man, the effects of amantadine, just like the medications we taught for reactive agitation, uh, are immediate. Mm -hmm. So you give a pill and 90 minutes, because it takes about 90 minutes for a PO medication to get into circulation, unless it's absorbed in the t under the tongue. Uh, you know, it, it takes about 90 minutes to kick in, and then you expect it to, to be better. So a lot of times, when I'm not sure whether they have akesthesia or not, I say, well, give them, give them 50 milligrams of amantadine and call me back in 90 minutes, you know, with the response. Because that's how quickly it should kick in. And so they say, oh, yeah, they're, they're calm now. Then I know that I can put them on a maintenance dose, yeah. right? Um, sometimes uh, I use Neurontin or Gabapentin. Uh, start off with 100 milligrams twice a day and then slowly increase. Um, but gabapentin is even more likely to cause orthostasis than Neurontin. So you have to be very cautious of gabapentin. Uh, it causes sedation, um, but it probably causes sedation by causing orthostatic hypotension. Um, you can use Enderol. Enderol is not an easy medication to use in the elderly, but Enderol also works for akesthesia. And we have to check what with Enderol? The heart rate. Right. You got to make sure the EKG is okay, and you got to make sure that they don't have more than a first degree AV block on EKG, and that um, they, they don't become bradycardic on it. Mm -hmm. And also, you have to watch asthma because if you give a um, if you give somebody who has as a bad asthma enderol, you might make them worse. So you usually put um, to check pulse rate prior to giving, right? But then hold if it's below a certain rate. I don't usually do that unless I find that they have pre-existing uh, bradycardia. Okay doesn't usually, because you're starting at 10 milligrams once or twice a day, uh, and you don't have to go too high to, to get the effect if you're going to get it. Um, so I don't usually do that okay. with Enderol, but I do check their EKG to make sure they don't have second degree AV block or something, then it would be a big problem. Mm -hmm. So some of these other vocal... Oh, okay. So patients who yell, um, the most common type of yeller Besides an old yeller, you, you're too young to. No, I know who an old yeller is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the most common type of yeller is a repetitive yeller, um, and that and they repetitively yell, "Help, help, please, God, help me." Okay, and it can go on for hours at a time. The most common cause of that is agoraphobia, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, feeling like they don't know what to do, where to go, feeling lost, abandoned. Um, it occurs when the patient's alone. Um, you go in to say, Ms. Jones, why are you yelling? You know, what's wrong? What do you need? I don't need anything. <laughs> you know, well, you were yelling help. Was I? <laughs> you know, and, then, and then as soon as the nurse walks out of the room, help, help, <laughs> help, help. <laughs> you know, so it's, it looks manipulative. Uh, it looks attention-seeking. And in, and in some sense, it is attention-seeking, but it's not purposeful attention-seeking. Right. It is the, the threat detection system is going off. 
and so that is indicating to the patient that something's wrong and it's associated with fear so they're often very fretful mm -hmm. so fretful is crying due to fear not crying due to sadness so they're they're scared um, and if you ask them um, instead of saying what do you need because they're yelling help because they don't need anything uh, if you ask them are you scared they'll say yes what are you scared of I don't, don't know. know yeah uh, are you scared that you don't know what to do or where to go? That's it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, do you feel better alone or with someone? With someone. Okay, so that indicates that they have agoraphobia. Alternatively, they could be yelling help, help, help because they're paranoid. Uh, and so when you ask those questions for agoraphobia, um, you know, do you feel better alone or with someone? Well, I feel fine with someone or, you know, or not. Um, do you feel like you don't know what to do or where to go? No. You know. Do you feel like someone is out to get you? Yes. Why are they out to get you? I don't know. Okay. So two totally different things. Yeah, two totally different things. So the patients with agoraphobia respond well to abuse bar. Mm -hmm. The patients who are paranoid respond well to an antipsychotic, right? You do like Zyprexa. That's right. I use Zyprexa for lots of reasons, but let's talk about agoraphobia first. Sure. So, you can start with Buspar 5 milligrams POTID and slowly increase it from 5 TID to 10 TID to 15 TID to 20 TID, probably within a week uh, of each increase, um, assuming that kidney function is normal. Mm -hmm. I've had one or two patients who were in renal failure, and as we increase the dose, it made it worse. So uh, there's a sweet spot, mm -hmm. you know, where you can go and no further. Um, and that works probably 75% of the time for agoraphobia. Uh, it doesn't always work. And then sometimes uh, I use catapress in very low doses for the, one, for the patients who don't respond to, to, to Buspar. I'll give them uh, 0.5 milligrams, a half a tablet of catapress, so 0.25 milligrams at HS. Watch their blood pressures, you know, to make sure I'm not making them hypotensive because it is an antihypertensive agent. But it's a it, it blocks uh, the you know the release of catecholamines, whereas Buspar works on serotonin. Both of those neurotransmitters are involved in anxiety syndromes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, sometimes that works probably 85 percent of the time. And if if those don't work, it is a struggle to find something that works well. Yes. But but they work most of the time. And would you say that these are the the residents that make the nursing staff the most crazy? They make everybody crazy, yeah. I mean, the patients who yell, I mean, it's incredible how they can yell so long. They must have, you know, biceps for vocal cords. Right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible how long they can yell. Um, but realize that they're not yelling on purpose. A lot of patients don't even know they're yelling. Right. I, you know, I wondered why, how people could yell words, like help, you know, things like that, uh, and not be aware of what they're yelling because you think that language in order to have language you have to be conscious of what you're saying right mm -hmm. but it's not true for limbic related words right. you know uh, limbic related words can come can percolate to the surface w without conscious can you think of decision. some other ones other words a uh, swear words uh -huh. yeah swear words so <laughs> some patients will swear a lot and you know they don't it, it's the same when when you get really angry at a spouse or somebody and you swear and, and you don't know why you swore. Well, right. it's because you don't premeditate it, right? It just comes out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we had talked about um, getting treatment with those medications for the agoraphobia. Right. And we we're going to talk about the next one, which yeah, was, was uh, for paranoia. For paranoia, which is usually Zyprexa. Yeah, I, I use Zyprexa because. Um, if you look at Seroquel or Clozaril, which cause the least Parkinsonism, they cause terrible orthostatic hypotension. They're strong alpha-1 antagonists. If you cause orthostatic hypotension, you're going to get a lot more of the agues. You're going to get confusion and falling, so you don't want to do that. Sometimes you have to go to Seroquel, and you know, usually you don't have to go to Clozaril, and then you have to watch and make sure you don't produce orthostasis. Um, Geodon... Um, Abilify, uh, Risperidol are strong dopamine antagonists. So not only are you going to, and, and they're strong alpha-1 antagonists, so not only are you going to get orthostatic hypotension, but you're going to get Parkinsonism. Uh, 
and it will occur, you know, within probably two or three weeks, and it's and it's going to have to happen in 99% of the people. And it's not to say that you haven't used those drugs, because you have. I mean, when you're desperate. Yeah, but, uh, rarely. 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 So. Um, and the family has to know the risk. Of, that's right. Of well, they always, whenever you use an antipsychotic, there should always be an antipsychotic consent form signed, read and signed, not mm -hmm. over the phone, read and signed by the healthcare power of attorney or guardian mm -hmm. okay, before you start the medication. So I usually say, you know, have them sign it, fax it to me before you start the medication. And then you'll get, get the order. That's right. So um, I use Zyprexa because if you use it at low enough doses, like 2.5 milligrams uh, a day, or I've used it as, as little as 2.5 milligrams every third day, mm -hmm. Um, to 2.5 a day to uh, up to 5 milligrams a day, you usually don't have to worry about orthostatic hypotension from it. You don't have to worry about anticholinergic side effects from it. You don't get as much Parkinsonism. Uh, you don't, I mean, it causes more Parkinsonism than Seroquel, but if you use it at those low doses, usually you can get away without causing enough Parkinsonism to make a difference. There's a new drug out called Placid, which is even better. Um, it doesn't cause orthostatic hypotension. It causes the least amount of Parkinsonism except for things like uh, Seroquel and, and uh, Clozaril, but it doesn't have the baggage uh, of the white count problems of Clozaril and the orthostatic hypotension of both Clozaril and Seroquel. So it's, it's a really good drug. It's not approved for dementia-related behaviors yet. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> So There's two other behaviors I want to talk about, and then yeah. I, I hope we still have time. I definitely want to get to some different types, just a couple different types of dementia that you currently see, and I want to get to orthostasis. I promise okay. we'll get to yeah. that. But the two other behaviors I want to talk about are uh, sexual behaviors, which we talked about could be delirium, but in cases that it's not delirium, what do you treat with? And then the second one is pseudobulbar. Okay. So um, I learned several years ago that... Um, hypersexual behavior occurred in about 14% of the patients I was seeing in long-term care. And we're, when we're talking hypersexual behaviors, I'm not talking about just hand-holding. I'm talking about overt sexual acts, you know, um, uh, you know, a patient grabbing, uh, you know, either another resident's uh, genitalia or, you know, other sex-related organs, um, trying to have sex with that person, that sort of thing. You typically see that it is one resident that they're targeted towards, right? Or is it just uh, anybody and everybody? It's, it's, it's often one resident, mm -hmm. but it can be um, it can be any male or any female. Right. So so females can have hypersexual behavior, and males can be hypersexual, um, and, and it's probably just as many males, just as many females. Uh, and sometimes they target just towards one. Sometimes it's you know uh, towards many. When it's targeted just towards one individual. There's often territorial behavior or possessive behavior that goes along that's even worse. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to discourage, you know, people forming couples in dementia units. But anyway, uh, we found that Tagamet works pretty well. Um, so it takes about two weeks to kick in. The dose is 300 milligrams POTID, and if you're going to use it, um, the, you know, you have to watch the aquin phosphatase. So it was interesting because um, I'm the one that wrote that article uh, back in 2001 on the use of tagamet for hypersexual behavior. So I was up in, in um, Upper Sandusky or Fostoria or something, seeing a patient in a long-term care facility up there. And I was talking to a nurse, and we were deciding on whether to use tagamet or not. And another physician came over and tapped me on the on the shoulder he says oh you got to use tagamet i used it it's such a great job <laughs> your legacy yeah, and I thought, yes <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but what i commonly see is they don't use it to that dose it's some ridiculous yeah. dose that nobody knows how to actually yeah, write yeah, yeah. for so. so when we did the initial study uh on, on tagamet it seems as though 300 milligrams three times a day was the best dose it takes about two weeks to kick in so and it typically only works if there's a problem with their Libido. 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 Yeah. So if it's a, if it's a, if that's a good, uh, that's a good comment. So if it's disinhibited sexual behavior, like for example, a female caregiver, you know, leaning over a male to give care and her breasts get in his face, he might 
grab out, right? Uh, that's not necessarily sexual. Right. So if it if it looks libidinally driven, in other words, lust driven, that's different, right? So Tagamet works for lust. It decreases lust uh, in males and females, and uh, works just as well in both. You can use uh, so you can use other androgen receptor antagonists besides Tagamet. Uh, we don't really know exactly how tagamet works. It's a known side effect that it decreases libido. Um, it's probably its effect on testosterone receptors in the brain, but it's not clear how it gets in the brain. Um, one of the drugs that works well is also ketoconazole, which is used for precocious puberty in children to decrease that by blocking testosterone. Um, that works pretty well, and sometimes I use them in combination when, when one doesn't work. But you have to get an ALT every week, according to the FDA now, if you use ketoconazole. So uh, that would have made it difficult to use. And then you can use spironolactone. So spironolactone is used by lots of, lots of people uh, for acne, um, and it's a diuretic. Um, uh, and it works on acne because of its effect on testosterone. And so it also works pretty well in patients who have hypersexual behavior, but yeah, it's harder to use because it's diuretic. Right, yeah, and older people are already dehydrated. So. Uh, frequently, yeah. Um, okay, and the last one, and we don't have to touch this on, on a lot, but usually in stroke. Oh, well, one other thing about, one other thing, I'm okay. sorry, uh, about hypersexual behavior. It can be caused by delirium. Yes. It's frequently caused by delirium. If you use medications for hypersexual behavior, in patients who have delirium, they will not work. You have to get rid of the cause of delirium. Mm -hmm. Then the hypersexual behavior goes away without adding anything. So, you, so you know, I, I, I suggested to this person one time that they use Tagamet for you know the patient that they were having difficulty with this hypersexual behavior, and uh, it didn't work, right? And they called me, and, and then I, I got some additional history, and it was clear that the patient had delirium. We got rid of that, and the patient was better. So sorry. No, it's okay. No, and we're we're gonna get to that at the end. But they were worth the stats, right? They were. <laughs> <laughs> um, How okay. did you know? So pseudo vulgar. Yeah. Uh, again, not. I mean, we saw a new drug come out years ago, and that was targeted towards this. But I think it's it's good to touch on you know this this resident that's crying or you know laughing without mostly we see crying. Yeah. So the pseudo vulgar state doesn't happen very often. Uh, it's seen, it can be seen in Alzheimer's disease. That's pretty uncommon. It can be seen uh, in PSP. It's more likely to be called, you know, seen in PSP and in ALS dementia related complex, ALS, uh, you know, without dementia. Uh, and in which case it's uh, where patients cry too easily. You know, they hear something sentimental, they cry. Um, and it's usually crying with large tears and, it, and facial flushing. So the face flushes, they have large tears, their mouth goes, hello, oh, they cry like this. <laughs> you know, they can't inhibit it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's brief, it doesn't last very long. You can um, talk with them, uh, change the tone of, 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 of the conversation so that you're not talking about something sentimental anymore, and it, you can see it just melt away, right? right? So that's pseudobulbar palsy or not pseudobulbar affect. There's another condition called pseudobulbar palsy in which they also have, you know, uh, multiple strokes uh, and they have, you know, difficulty moving, the so-called the palsy part, and they have this emotional incontinence. We call that emotional incontinence is the other term for um, pseudobulbar affect. And they're not depressed? They're not depressed, right. no. So what do you typically treat that with? Uh, a low-dose antidepressant. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you can use things like low dose Alexa, you can use low dose Vindafaxine, you can use low dose Zoloft. Uh, they usually work. So we're talking low doses. Uh, so if you're talking Lexapro, 5 to 10 milligrams. If you're talking uh, Zoloft, 25 to 50 milligrams. If you're talking Vindafaxine, 12.5 to 25 milligrams twice a day. Uh, and you expect it to be almost immediate. In, it's not like treating depression. It's almost immediate. And if you ask the patients if they're depressed, they say no. Right. They just cry easily. Mm -hmm. yeah. You brought up one diagnosis. I want to get, I don't, we could talk for five hours about different diagnoses, but there's two 
particular diagnoses I just want to talk about, and then we'll do orthostasis to round us okay. out. Okay. But the two, di two diagnoses I want to talk about, parasupranuclear palsy, PSP, because I think that me and you have seen a lot of them. A lot of them. And yeah. it's supposed to be this rare thing, but I walk into communities and I see people and I'm like, oh my gosh, or I'll be out at Bob Evans and see something. I'm like, I know they have PSP. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I want to talk about PSP. And then I also want to talk about Lewy body, just in the sense with Lewy body, here all the time of, you know, different residents that have dementia. And then I ask what the behaviors are and they say delusion. Oh, what are their delusions? kids and animals, and I know that that's most commonly in the body, but I never see a diagnosis of that. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two I just kind of want to briefly, briefly talk about, and then we'll get to orthostasis. Okay. So uh, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy uh, classically is associated with eye movement problems. So the patients have trouble uh, looking up and particularly trouble looking down. So, you, you know, you have the ball of your finger, they look up a little bit, maybe it's a little restricted, and you have them look down, and they have to move their head, and when they move their head, their eyes roll up. And their eyebrows are usually, like, yeah, yeah. flexed up they, yeah, they like use, this. Yeah, they usually have their, eye, you know, their forehead um, contracted so that their eyebrows move up, and they're attempting to open their eyes more widely, right? Mm -hmm. um, they may have a thing called lid apraxia, in which they can't open their eyes. They, you know, it looks like they have ptosis, mm -hmm. or they do have ptosis, but they, they can't open their eyes. Uh, once they're open, they can keep them open. So it's not like regular ptosis, you know, it's not like regular droopy eyelid. Uh, it's just they can't elevate the eyelid once it's closed. Um, and the biggest, biggest thing we see with PSP, which is why I wanted to bring this up, is falls. Falls, yeah, yeah. falls. Lots of falls. Lots of falls. So one of the common causes of repetitive falling it, or not common, but one of the things you need to think about is PSP because they have balance issues mm -hmm. uh, in addition to eye movement problems. And they have this pseudobulbar affect and they have, you know, um, this kind of uh, fixed smile sometimes. Yeah, they get like force their smile. Very, yeah, it's yeah. very odd. Yeah. It, and again, usually, once you've seen one, I'm yeah, like, yeah. oh my gosh. Well, when you walk in the room, uh, you know, and you see somebody that's not following you with their eyes, mm -hmm. you know, and their eyes are wide open, uh, and they kind of move and block, I mean, I, I immediately start thinking, okay, this person, so I can tell, usually by walking in the room for 30 seconds that the patient, that PSP is in the differential, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, you talk to them and you get this particular type of dysarthria, this kind of, so it's, it's kind of a cerebellar spastic speech. They have swallowing problems, they have um, gait problems, they stand up, they lose their balance and, uh, almost immediately. And they're usually pseudobulbar, right? They're usually pseudobulbar. Mm -hmm. So they're crying a lot. That's right. And um, when you tap their, you know, classically, they're hyperreflexic and have extensor planner responses. But not all patients are classic. Some are more Parkinsonian mm -hmm. than others. Some patients have the eye movement problems, but they don't have the falling problems. You know, so, and, and some, there, there are other conditions that cause eye movement problems. So, so dementia with Lewy bodies can cause supranuclear gaze palsies as well. Um, so we didn't have to go into treatment. I just thought it was worth saying, so people yeah. can be on the lookout for that. One of the things that to keep in mind about uh, PSP is that these patients 